Thank you, and welcome. Uh, firstly, thank you for prioritizing audio over the World Cup, because I know there's a lot of people rushing to the pub at the moment, trying to get the best seats uh, for the Germany game. Um, I'm personally very excited to be here, because normally, when I give a talk about audio, I'm shoved in the room at the back of the conference with the rubbish sound system, and you know, there's not enough room for everyone. So it's quite a privilege for me to have big speakers and a big stage. So um, yeah, thank you to, to DroidCon. So I'm going to talk about real-time audio. And the first thing I'm going to do is talk about a new audio API, which we launched uh, in the past few months, called Oboe. Um, this is a high-performance audio library written in C++, and it's designed for uh, low-latency audio, so real-time, when you tap on the screen, producing audio as quickly as humanly possible. I'm also going to show you how to obtain the lowest latency across the widest range of devices. And I'm also going to show you how to optimize your uh, computational bandwidth and how to debug audio glitches and like profile your code so you can wring the maximum performance out of Android. So to do all this, I'm going to build, hopefully, a synthesizer app. Now, it's not going to be as advanced as this thing here. It's going to be literally tapping on the screen, producing a sound. So this will be the architecture of the app that I'm about to build. We have a synth class. Oh, by the way, this is all in um, C++. So hopefully, you weren't expecting Java. Um, C++, the reason why we use C++ in audio is because we don't have the garbage collector. And the garbage collector basically messes with everything to do with audio. So virtually all proper audio pro programming is done in C and C++. So anyway, we have this synth class. It is going to create an audio stream. And that's provided by this new oboe library. And it's responsible for putting audio data out to the speakers or headphones. So it's, um, it creates a pipe between the Android audio framework and the audio hardware. We're also going to create some audio rendering objects. So these are objects which output uh, digital audio data. In our case, um, a square wave, um, which will be fun. Now, when the audio stream needs more data, it's going to give us a callback. And this callback is on audio ready, and it's basically the audio stream saying, hey, send me more data. So we have this loop, this callback loop um, of the audio stream wanting more data, and then we render more data into that audio stream. And lastly, we have a tap event. And that's going to trigger our rendering objects on and off. So before I get started into uh, live coding, I uh, just wanted to give a quick uh, background of why to use this new library. Firstly, you can write less code. So before Oboe, you used to have to write this much code just to create an audio stream using an API called OpenSLES. Um, who's used OpenSLES here? Two people. OK. You're very lucky you don't have to use it anymore. So this is the equivalent code. Uh, using Oboe. So six lines of code, and in fact, only three of them are mandatory. So th these other three are just for setting your preferred properties on the audio stream. Next, it's open source. So all the code is available on GitHub. Um, and I guess there's a few reasons why this is really great. Number one, we're not tied to the Android release cycle. So we can fix things instantly, rather than waiting six months or a year for a bug fix to, uh, to come out. Um, it's also like a great place for people to discuss audio problems and fix bugs and all sorts of stuff. So um, that's pretty cool. It works down to API 16. So the number one problem that I hear from developers is, hey, you've, you've got a new audio API, but I can't use it because I need to target all of these other devices. So uh, Oboe works um, with nearly 100% of Android devices. And the way that it does this is it still uses OpenSLES under the hood, but on newer devices, it uses the new A-Audio High Performance Audio API, which came out with Oreo. 
And lastly, yeah, it's designed for high performance. So low latency, high computational bandwidth. Um, it's going to give you the best performance. All right, here we go. So I'm going to switch over to Android Studio. Um, just a show of hands, who's used Android Studio? Everyone, great. Who's used Android Studio for native development? OK, so about half. Um, so in the new release of Android Studio 3.2, uh, native support got a whole lot better. So um, there's a profiler, which I'll, I'll talk about. But basically, it makes it a whole lot easier to write, write native code directly in Android Studio. OK, so I have kind of a template, kind of Hello World audio app here set up. And what I'll do is I will run it just to prove that there's no kind of smoke and mirrors. Now, I'm going to run it on this device here, this Pixel XL. And you should see a, oh, yeah, I'm sure at the back you can barely see this, but when I tap on the screen, nothing happens. That's kind of the key thing to, to remember. So uh, I'm in C++, so I have um, a implementation file, and I also have a header file. So this is my synth header file. First thing I'm going to do is include the oboe header. And I'm also going to use the oboe namespace. And this just saves me from having to type oboe colon colon every time I want to use a, an oboe object. So I'll switch over to my implementation file. Now, the first thing I want to do is build an audio stream. And to do that, I use an audio stream builder. And once I have my builder, I can start setting properties on it. These are my desired properties for my audio stream. So first thing I'm going to do is set the format. And I can choose from two formats, either floating point or 16-bit integers. I'm going to use floats because floats are better. Um, if you don't believe me, uh, you can look on YouTube. Um, so actually, if a point on this. If I was writing this for the widest range of devices, I would have to support both 16-bit integers and floating point audio. Um, and the example on GitHub does both of those things. So, but for, um, for time constraints, I'm just going to use floating point audio here. Um, I'm going to set a channel count to two. Uh, that means that it's a stereo audio stream. We have two ears, so stereo kind of makes sense. And that's all I need to set here. So now I just ask my builder to open a stream. And that wants a reference to a stream pointer. So this is one of these times where Android Studio really helps me out. So I'm going to declare a variable here. Obviously, um, it's in red because I haven't declared it anywhere else. If I do Option Enter, I get these nice quick help things, and I can create a new field. I'm sure you can do this in Java as well, but uh, create a new field called mstream. And there it creates it for me in the header. And once I've opened that stream, I need to start it. And I can do that asynchronously using request start. And that's all I need to do to create an audio stream. The thing is, although that's created a pipe down to the audio hardware, I haven't actually got any way of getting audio data into that stream yet. And the way I do that is to create a callback. So I can do set callback. And this is going to want me to pass in an audio stream callback object. So I could either create one, or I could use uh, my existing synth class and implement that interface. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'll just do this here, go back to my header, and implement this interface, audio stream callback. Another nice feature of Android Studio is um, I can do Control O, and it's going to show me all the methods of the interface which I'm implementing. So the method that I want is on audio ready, and it auto-populates both the header and the implementation file with the, um, with the method. So I'll just get rid of this. Right, let me just move this over so you can see. So this is the method signature here. This is the stream which wants more audio data. This is a container array which I'm going to place my audio data into. And this is the number of frames of audio data which I'm required to, to render. Uh, so what I need is something to produce the data. Now, in a classic move, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the show Blue Peter, um, 
Here's one I made earlier, which is an oscillator. So this oscillator here has a method called render audio. It takes a container array of audio data, and it will also take a number of frames that I need to render. And all it does, you, know, you, can, you can look up the theory behind oscillators, but all it does is output um, a negative signal and a positive signal. And it varies between the two based on the frequency uh, of the oscillator. So I'm going to use that in my synthesizer. So let's just define one here, call it M OSC. Again, it's showing red. Option Enter will include the header up here. So before I can use my oscillator, I need to set a couple of properties on it. So I'll do um, M OSC set amplitude, which is kind of the volume. So I'll set that to 0.9, kind of 90% of maximum. Um, we want to set the sample rate, which is the rate at which we are going to be producing this, this audio data. And that is dependent on our stream. So if I ask my stream what its sample rate is, I can just pass that in. Now, what else do I need to do? OK. Um, frequency. So uh, give me a number between 50 and 150. Someone in the audience. Let's make it. How, how much? 73. 73. OK, let's go with that. Thank you. So this is going to set our oscillator's frequency to 73 hertz. I just had a moment of panic there where 73 hertz might be like brown. You have, have you heard of brown noise, the frequency of your bowels? Let's hope it's not that. Uh, so. Now that I've set everything up for my oscillator, I now need to render the oscillator's data into the audio stream down here. So render audio. And that's expecting an array of floats. But notice how our audio data here is an array of void star. The reason for this is, as I mentioned before, we could have two formats here. We could have floating point, or we could have 16-bit integers. So because I know that our stream is in floating point, I need to cast it back to being a, an array of floats. So I'll just do a static cast float and that there. And then all I need to do is pass in the number of frames which I want to render. Last thing I need to do is return from, um, from this method. I can re either return continue, which will carry the callbacks on, or I can stop, and they will stop. So let's continue. Data callback result, continue. OK, so that's everything set up there. Final step in the chain is when I tap down on the screen, I want the oscillator to switch on. And when I lift up, I want it to switch off. So I can do that quite simply by doing set wave on is down. Now, is that everything? I do hope so. OK, I'll save that, run it, and let's see what happens. OK, so what should happen is when I tap on the screen, we should hear a 73 hertz square wave. There we go. OK, so that worked. And hopefully, you can see how easy it is to start building a synthesizer um, using the Oboe library. But there's one kind of key constraint that we have when we're building real-time audio apps, which is we want the time between tapping on the screen or any kind of input signal to outputting the sound to be as small as possible. So if I tap here, I mean, I know when I'm tapping, but I can hear that there's a noticeable delay there. So let's measure it. Um, to measure latency, I'm going to use a program called Audacity. I'm going to use my MacBook's microphone. And I'm going to measure the sound of my finger slapping against the screen. And then I'm also going to measure um, when the output comes from this monitor speaker behind me. And hopefully, we will see two impulses, and we can measure the delta between them. So let's go. Except I have not muted my Mac, so it's going to sound horrible. Hang on. Right. OK, so it's recording. Uh, 
Right, so you can see here, it's not that clear, but this is the impulse of my finger slapping the screen, and this is the square wave here. So if we measure the distance between those two, we've got down here, we've got the time in milliseconds, 139 milliseconds, and I'll just do a couple of other measurements. So there's the wave starting there, 131. And it's about there, 128. So we're between 130 and 140 milliseconds of latency um, for, for, for this app. Now, that latency is coming from a number of different sources. We have the touch sensor, which introduces between maybe 15 to 30 milliseconds. Um, we have the app itself which is outputting the data, and that's the thing we're going to focus on. But we also have a small amount of latency between the speaker here and the microphone here. It's about two meters, maybe six milliseconds of latency. So the only thing we can really control is what happens inside our app. We can't control all the external sources. So let's look at how we can improve this figure. So what we're trying to do is optimize the output latency. We can do this in a number of ways. Number one, we can set a performance mode on the audio stream. Now, by default, there's no optimization of the stream. Um, if we were creating uh, a streaming music app, we might want to use the power saving mode, which is going to give us less callbacks and conserve serve battery. But what we want is the low latency performance mode. Next. We have this concept of a sharing mode on an audio stream. So by default, your app shares its stream with all other audio streams on, on Android. All these streams run into a mixer, and then they all go through the audio device. So any system sounds that were occurring on this device would, would also be played at the same time as our app. But on API 27, we introduced a new mode called Exclusive, where if the audio device supports it, and it needs uh, four input channels to support it, then you can have an exclusive stream straight to the audio device. It cuts out the mixer and cuts out a few milliseconds of latency. Right, lastly, we can control the buffer size inside our audio stream. So imagine that first time that a callback occurs, our app is going to output something called a burst of audio data. And this is the minimum amount of data that can be consumed by the audio device in one go. So we start getting these callbacks, and we start outputting audio data. And that first burst of information is kind of on this conveyor belt. Uh, and it takes a while to hit the audio device. So we can say that the size of our buffer is proportional to the latency. So given that we can control our audio stream buffer size, why don't we just set it to one buffer? Like, that's going to give us the minimum latency. Now, we could. We, could. we could definitely do this. But in the world of audio, sometimes things don't go quite as planned. We might get a callback late. Or we might not output this information into the buffer in time, in which case we would get an underrun or an audio glitch, which would be horrible to listen to. So what we generally recommend is use two bursts, and this gives us a good trade-off between latency and glitch protection. And on API 26, you can also do something called dynamic tuning, where you test to see whether or not you're getting any underruns. And if you are, you increase the buffer size accordingly. So you can, you can uh, tweak it based on, on the device's capability. So let's do it. So I'll just switch back to Android Studio. And what I can do is use my builder again, and I'll do set performance mode. So performance mode, low latency. And the sharing mode is the same kind of thing. Exclusive. Now, to set the buffer size, I actually need the stream to be open first. So I do. Stream set buffer size in frames. Now, I talked about this concept of a burst. I need to know what the burst size is. And I can get that directly from the stream. And I said that we're going to use two buffers. So I'll just use two there. 
And that is all we need to do to optimize the latency. So let's rerun our app. I will switch back to Audacity, get rid of this old test. So again, when I tap on the screen, we should hear the sound. So I'll start recording. OK, so you can see quite clearly the impulses from the, the slap. Um, it's not so easy to see when the square wave came in. Maybe if I increase this. Um, I wonder if I could just have a bit more volume when I run the test. and It should pick it up a bit more. OK, that's good. So zoom in here. So I know from experience it should be about there. Yeah, that's right. So what we're seeing is the tail end of my finger slap, and then the wave starts about here. So on that one, we are at 44 milliseconds. Forty milliseconds, and okay, we'll we'll leave it there for that. So we've gone from between 130 and 120 milliseconds down to about 40 milliseconds. So we've taken off 90 milliseconds of latency um, just by making those fairly simple optimizations, which is kind of handy. And at this level, it's actually—I mean, you can play with it afterwards, but and the code is all on GitHub, but. It's very playable. Like it feels almost instantaneous when I'm. I don't know if you can see this. So if you have an app which is uh, very latency sensitive, it doesn't actually have to be a musical app. It could be like an audio amplifier or something to do with with VR, where it's important that the sound moves um, with with what's going on on screen. We launched a, a standard called the Pro Audio Standard, and there are devices which. Uh, conform to this standard and have uh, a guaranteed round trip latency of under 20 milliseconds. And if you just want to target these devices, you can check for the hardware feature flag uh, Android Hardware Audio Pro in your manifest. So, um, showed you how to use the API, showed you how to get the optimal latency, and now I'm going to show you how to optimize CPU performance. So. I promised a 100 oscillator synthesizer. And I stole this idea from a guy com called Look Mum No Computer, um, who's this like punk synth electronics guy who builds these crazy instruments. And one of the instruments he built was um, this 100 oscillator synthesizer out of old 555 timer chips. And I just thought, that's amazing. Like, I've got to build that uh, as an app. And it's a perfect example of. Um, how you can push the CPU to the limit um, in, in software by just doing the same thing 100 times. So here's what we're going to do. We've got one oscillator, which is outputting into the audio stream. We're going to change that to 100 oscillators, put it through a mixer, and, um, and mix the outputs together. So let's do it. Right. So here's my oscillator. I'm going to change that to an array of 100 oscillators. Now, I've got to mess around with this a little bit. So each one of these oscillators needs um, setting up. Now, firstly, I don't want the amplitude to be uh, nearly at maximum, because it would blow our ears off. So let's just make that a bit quieter. OK, sample rate can stay the same for all of them. Now, I'm just going to make this a little bit more interesting, and I'm going to change the frequency. I'll do this in a minute. Uh, change the frequency every time we tap, so there will be some variation in the sound. So, so I need a mixer object. I'll just switch over to the header here, define a mixer. Again, I made this earlier. So, But essentially, all it does is, is sum the outputs of e each oscillator. So once I've set up each oscillator, I'm just going to add them to the mixer. Here we go. So.
So, right, let's set up a frequency. And I'm going to use a base frequency of 50 hertz and then a random frequency um, of between, let's say, 100. So times 100. Just cast that to float. OK, I think that's right. OK. So set the frequency here. And I'm also going to introduce some variation in the frequency of each oscillator. Otherwise, it will just sound exactly the same. So let's do I cast that to a float over 300. OK, last thing I need to do is change from rendering using a single oscillator to using the mixer. Right, let's see if this works. OK, so building, running, what we should hear is 100 oscillators. That's what you all came for, right? So. OK, so you can hear there's something crazy going on there. Um, it should be a fairly pure sound, but just listen carefully. It sounds nasty, like there's something horrible going on there. And what we can hear there is what I have to listen to all day, every day, audio glitches. So whenever I hear an audio glitch, um, I mean, I'm a little bit dismayed to start with, but then I call on one tool, and that tool is SysTrace. So SysTrace is your friend when, you, um, when you're debugging audio glitches. So what I'm going to do now is run a real-time SysTrace on this app, and we should see some information about what's going on. So what I'm going to do is um, run all the oscillators, run the trace for five seconds. OK, so it's completed, and it's going to output an HTML file. And if I just open this HTML file, trace.html, here we go. I think I need to switch out of presentation mode. Hang on, sorry. Uh, what is going on here? Ah, here we go. So here's my trace. And this line here. Uh, AA ready shows me the status of my audio streams buffer. And what we can see if we zoom in here, uh, let's just zoom in like this, we can see that something horrible is going on. We've got a full buffer here, we've got half a buffer here, and then it drops down to nothing. And every time we see it drop down to nothing, it means there was an underrun. And that's what you can hear with these horrible kind of glitching noises. Um, so we know, actually, it's not our ears deceiving us. It's actually genuinely um, an, a, a real problem that we have to deal with. So what's causing these underruns? Well, here's the next tool that I'm going to show you. So Android Studio 3.2 has this wonderful new native profiler in it. So what I'm going to do is run the same test, but I'm going to um, let's just go on here. I'm going to run the same test, but using this profiler. So I've started the profiler. Click on CPU. And it's going to show me all the threads which are running on, uh, on the device. And let's record a trace for five seconds. So again, OK, so this is going to record the time spent in every method in our app which is super useful. Let me just change this. So 
you'll notice here there's actually two threads called Obo Mega Drone, which is the, uh, the name of my app. This is the UI thread. We don't want this. What we want is the audio thread. Down here, it shows us all of these, these method calls. It's kind of difficult to understand. But if we order by the time spent in each method using this flame chart, we should be able to see here we have our oscillator render audio method. I don't know if you can see. You can just see on the bottom there. We are spending, out of those five seconds that we were pro profiling, we are spending 4.71 of those seconds rendering our, our audio. That is far too long. We need to be way below the five second mark in order to make sure that every time that callback happens, we hit the deadline for rendering that, that data. So what can we do now? Well, really, the profiler just gives us uh, um, sort of the, the smoking gun, where is all our time going? So I can look inside our oscillator and, and say, OK, well, inside this method here, this is where we're spending all this time. So this took me quite a while to de debug, but what I found was that the compiler was not picking up my optimization flag. So I was telling it to do all possible optimizations, um, but actually it was doing none of them. And long story short, um, we can fix this by changing our build file so that it actually specifies for our debug build that we want this optimization setting here. And that's going to let the compiler do its, do its work and uh, optimize all of our rendering code. So the point of this is not to, not to show you how to add optimization flags to your build. The point is use the profiler to pinpoint where your um, rendering problems are, are occurring. So now if I rerun this, hopefully it should sound a bit better. OK, so here we go. There we go, OK. So no audio glitches, um, and it sounds, well, I wouldn't say it sounds beautiful, but it sounds pretty good, I think. So in summary, just switch back here. Um, so I showed you how to use the, the Obo API, showed you how to get the best latency across, across the widest range of devices, how to optimize CPU performance using SysTrace and the profiler, and uh, yeah, download Obo, start building amazing audio apps uh, today. And if you find any issues, then file them on GitHub, or even better, file a pull request. So. Um, that's almost it. Um, if you love coding and you love talking about code, uh, I'm sure you would love working at Google. We have two vacancies in our team. If you're interested, search for developer programs engineer, and um, it would be great to have you on board. So um, that's it for me. Thank you all very much. Everyone is early today. Do we have questions? Wow. Oh, two. Yeah, you can go first, and I'll give you. If you go there, that's easier. Oh, perfect. Uh, actually, just two questions. Uh, the first question is um, the example project that you just did. Like, yeah. um, do you have it on GitHub as well? Or yeah, you absolutely. So awesome. if, you, if you search for Mega Drone. Make it run, on, okay. on Obo, all the codes there. It's actually a lot better code than, than I wrote here, as in it handles the different formats, and um, it's, it's a lot more robust. Yeah, that's just to get started a little bit easier, because then yeah, sure. there's an example. Um, and the second question is, um, so basically, uh, the Oboe, is it also possible like, to um, have it like as a, a library project for Unity, or? Yeah, of course. Possibly? I mean, it's just uh, straight C++, so you can compile it as a library, ship it with your your app, um, or you can, uh, the way that we distribute it at the moment is it's a source library, so you just compile in the bits you need. Um, okay. It keeps the, the APK size down, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, cheers. Uh, and, hey. uh, thank you for your talk, it was great. And cheers. my question might sound a bit silly, but would it work to increase the buffer size to get rid of the glitches? Of course, yeah, you, you, that's, that's a great question. Uh, historically, this is why Android's audio latency has been so bad. Because the easiest thing you can do to get rid of an audio glitch is increase the buffer size. And you increase it until the glitches go away. Um, but that means sometimes, I mean, a few years ago, there was an Android device on the market which had like 
300 milliseconds of latency between tapping the screen and, and hearing the sound, and there was nothing you could do about it because some engineers somewhere heard the audio glitch and went, hey, just increase the buffer size, rather than optimizing um, the, the signal path. So, yeah. Thank you very much. OK, cheers. Perfect. Hi, thanks you for the talk. Um, one question, I checked the API and I've seen that the on audio start, uh, the, the audio stream can never be null. So it is always a valid object there and why is it the pointer then? Because I'm developing since 20 years in C++ and have seen in this two days very uh, a lot of people scared about, oh, C++, it's with pointers, I, I don't want to use it. And the, the interface uses pointers at places I think it shouldn't be, it could be referenced then. So when it, when it comes to audio programming, forget the rest of C++ best practice. Well, that's a bit of an exaggeration. But um, the reason why we use pointers is just for performance reasons. Um, yeah. Yeah, but the uh, reference is, it's like a pointer. Yeah. But, you, yeah. but so, it, so what, so I don't really understand your question. Um, it's more about the API design. Ah, OK. It, so yeah, what? The, the function, the, the callback gets a pointer to an audio stream, and the pointer can be null or an object. And in this case, the audio stream can never be null. It, 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 it's always valid. So it's, if you pass just a the reference, then I know at the, at the one that is called, I know, OK, I don't have to check if this pointer is null or not. Or not, and that, I mean you're correct. It's it's never null. The reason why we pass in the the audio stream is because you could have multiple callbacks. Let's say you're doing input and output. They're both running on callbacks. You would need to distinguish between um, those those two objects. Maybe, maybe we can talk after. Yeah, maybe you can continue like cool, afterwards. No more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Thanks.